Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending to our talk. I know it's uh, the last one, so probably you want to go to sleep. And like enough with that already, right? So we're here to make it very easy and lightweight and just show you how we hacked the biggest AI infrastructure in the world and do it like very light and easy and with a lot of jokes. So I hope you enjoy it. And let's uh, quickly start by uh, introducing ourselves first. So I'm Gal, I'm the co-founder and CTO of uh, Oligo Security. With me, Avi is one of our AI security ninjas. And really quickly about ourselves, um, Avi, pass it to you. You can start introducing yourself. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm Avi Lomelski. I'm an AI security researcher in the CTO office of Oligo. I have around uh, 10 years of experience in AI uh, engineering and uh, focusing on security research these days and on my spare time. I love to climb mountains, and uh, if you're into it, so let me know after the session. I know it's a big thing in the US. And with me is Gal, uh, my awesome CTO. So, hi, everyone. I'm Gal. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Oligo. Prior to Oligo, I was leading the research group of Checkpoint, basically hacking the biggest application in the world, and then go doing lectures about it, Black Hat, DEF CON, these type of conferences. And I'm super famous for um, being handsome, because I cannot climb mountains, right? <laughs> So um, let's start with a quick agenda. Um, so what we're going to discuss today basically is the, um, the concept that we dubbed and called shadow vulnerabilities. Basically, it's those type of um, risk that doesn't get a CVE assigned. You might hear this analogy from different industries, but we're going to explain what this term means and what shadow vulnerabilities really are. Then we're going to deep dive into one of the example of a very famous shadow vulnerability that we found that actually led to the discovery of Shelltorch. And of course, we're going to discuss how we scaled it. Uh, it's a new approach that we invented. It's called reverse fuzzing. Basically, what you know as traditional fuzzing, but the other way around. And then we're going to discuss the Shelltorch vulnerabilities themselves. And of course, we're not going to give you stranded. We're going to discuss how you can detect or even prevent those type of attacks. So, Cool, let's begin and really deep dive into what shadow vulnerability basically mean. So you probably heard this concept or this shadow term from other industries, shadow data for the data that you don't monitor so you don't know what's going on, or shadow IT for workloads or machine that you don't monitor so you don't know what's going on. So we send the same analogy exactly, shadow vulnerabilities, this type of vulnerability doesn't get a CVE assigned, right? And it can happen due to different reasons. It can be a vulnerability that it's in dispute, and the maintainer don't want to fix it, or it's an example of developers not following best practices and leading to this risk that's actually happening, or just insecure by design libraries. And all of those type of shadow examples are, in the end, uh, silent misconfigurations that are very, very devastating, because on one hand, security tools are not aware of them and cannot be aware of them, right? We're scanning for CVE, this common vulnerability entity that like, helps us to understand, and if we don't have it, so we're like blind to that risk. And in the end, all of those type of, uh, of shadow vulnerabilities actually lurk inside their documentation that no one ever reads, right, including us. Uh, so uh, we're going to give some example of our shadow vulnerabilities that we found. And you can see that for each and every vulnerability, there is a, a section in the docs very, very hidden that say, oh, it's a warning, or you should not do that, or just throwing responsibility on the developers themselves. We cannot expect for a developer to be a security expert in Java object handling or a data engineer to be an expert in Node and how this language is being attacked. And this is the reason why you're going to see all of those shadows vulnerabilities starting from this simple throwing responsibility in the docs that, again, no one reads, even us. And this is why we are, as an attacker, started to look for those type of examples. This is how we got to find a lot of those shadow vulnerabilities. So now I'm going to pass it back to Avi, the real smart guy here that hacked everyone. And he's going to explain a very uh, interesting shadow example that we found in a very famous library that actually led to the discovery of Shelltorch. Amazing. So thank you, Gal, again, for being so awesome. And um, let's dive into uh, the first example. Uh, I wish we had more time, but uh, sadly, um, uh, it's pretty short. Um, this example shadow vulnerability that I'm about to um, um, show you uh, affects not only Shelltorch, which is around PyTorch and Torserve, if you know it already. Uh, it also affects Apache Cassandra and uh, uh, Confluent Server, which is the, uh, one of the most 25 targeted servers according to the NSA. And if you ever use Java, you must have used SyncYAML before. Uh, directly or indirectly, so 
Uh, today we work with YAML almost everywhere. Kubernetes is almost entirely based on YAML files, for example. So uh, if you want to work with YAML in Java, this is the go-to. Now, if you look closely inside the documentation, you'll notice that it allows you to construct any kind of Java object. Any type of Java object, Avi? Yeah, so any type. Wow. Which might get me uh, thinking. Um, and eventually, the default constructor, the default behavior is what matters the most. So apparently, the default constructor of Snake YAML uh, is um, unsafe by default. And in this example, you can see uh, an arbitrary code that is attack and controlled. Um, that when this payload is passed to the YAML file, it will execute it, uh, just like that, without thinking twice, without validating it. And this is the default behavior of the library. So the interesting thing is, what did the maintainers have to say about it? So of course, it's all in the docs. Um, the maintainers said that uh, it can, by default, construct a JavaScript, a Java object, sorry, of any type, and therefore it won't be fixed. And, and he said that the migration is very simple. Simply use safe constructor. And um, this is a classic case of not a bug, uh, it's a feature. And uh, we went on and tried to understand it, uh, what it means even further, and what can be the common pitfalls uh, the developers might run into. So here you can see uh, the result of uh, someone that extends safe constructor uh, to its own constructor. At the very moment you extend it, you drop all the safety of the constructor. There, th that's the main common pitfall. And also it allows you to create a reference of a safe constructor, C, and have a value that is constructor that extends it. So um, it's very misleading. So Snake YAML is not so safe by default. And when we presented all of those evidence to the, uh, to the maintainers, uh, he said something uh, pretty uh, funny, which we kind of understood, but uh, uh, let's understand what it means. They said that 100% of the projects and applications that depend on Snake YAML uh, are 100% safe, and they don't uh, use a code from an untrusted source. So we tried to validate it uh, using something called reverse fuzzing, which I'll dive into soon, but there is a constant tension between the user and the project maintainer, and you just uh, it, it will always be there, as long as we have open source, and people maintain them. So um, we talked so far about the technical part, and now let's talk about the ethical uh, part of the things. And this is a classic uh, scenario where the maintainer and the user don't agree upon something, and the maintainer has the power. So just to go over that, uh, first of all, when someone say 100%, it's okay. We know for 100%, we, it's going to have a problem, right? This is why we decided to deep dive. But also, just to mention, like, we do understand each and every side, right? Like, the developers, they cannot be a security expert in each and every language, right? They want to use an open source, they just use it. And the maintainers, they have, like, thousands of open sources. Now they need to be responsible for each and every library and its own security risk, right? And, and the actual, like, users themselves, like, and, and each and every angle here is, like, like, we can understand it. We don't have the right solution, right? And, and, and like, this is why we should think it should be a community effort, and we'll deep dive into that. But just to mention, like, we're not blaming anyone. We're just raising those problems and, like, starting to talk who actually owns the responsibility. Amazing. Thank you, Gal. Um, now, I'm going to dive into something we call reverse fuzzing. Um, and what I want you to take from the previous example, from, the, um, from uh, section two, uh, is that it's only one vulnerability that affects many open sources, and there are much more shadow vulnerabilities that some of them are already uh, out there and some of them are not. Some of them still lurk uh, in the code and uh, wait to be uh, uh, found. And uh, now I'm going to talk about how we managed to scale this technique in order to find um, vulnerable targets or prime targets, in other words. Uh, these are projects that are very interesting uh, in high use by big organizations. Um, so we wanted to automate the process instead of going next, next, next on GitHub uh, search results, and um, we, went to, uh, we wanted to scale the attack. So in traditional fuzzing, what we do is we take a bunch of, inf of inputs. Uh, you have many open sources that do it automatically. Google does it uh, with OSS fuzz and the async fuzz loop and, and so on. So you have a lot of projects to fuzz software where you have a bunch of inputs. You just feed it to the application, uh, which is the target, and you expect it to break eventually. 
So considering infinite amount of inputs, eventually the application will break because we are all human and we uh, don't think of every single scenario in advance and um, it's just the way it is. And this is how people are fuzzing for uh, exploits these days and try to patch them automatically. Now, we did the exact opposite. We took one vulnerable code pattern, which I'm about to show you, and we tried to identify the projects that use uh, the open source in the vulnerable way, in the, mid, in the unsafe way, and so on. If you go on GitHub and you just try to search for the constructor, um, which is unsafe by default, um, you would see uh, 4,200 possible targets. And filtering them out, and of course this is just one example, we have many more of them, we want the ability to scale it. And um, what we did is we tried to filter it by stars, because this is, this is the travel thing to do. Now, GitHub does not allow you to filter by stars, at least not from the UI, so you can see we have zero results. So we just tried the API, and it worked, of course. So you have the size parameter, which is interesting. You can just um, fuzz it as well, and eventually uh, have a list of all the open sources that use a specific uh, code pattern, and the amount of stars that they have. So we did it, and we filtered out those two. Um, these two examples use YAML in an uh, unsafe and safe way. So uh, the second one is the interesting glide I want you to focus on. You have to pass a new safe constructor to the new YAML in order to uh, make it safe. And of course, it's not the default expected behavior. And uh, we saw very few projects that do it among thousands of projects. So um, the ecosystem is kind of broken because the default matters mo more than anything. Now, thanks to CodeQL and this uh, simple query, we managed to uh, scale, scale everything and make um, these 4,200 targets uh, to only a few which are very vulnerable. As I said, we have um, TortServe, which I'm about to dive into. We have Confluence, we have Apache Cassandra, which is the uh, most widely used uh, NoSQL server out there. And um, I wish we had more time to uh, talk about all of them. I think all of them are uh, equivalently interesting. But I'm here to uh, talk about ShellTorch, which is a chain of, uh, of vulnerability that when changed together um, can do something very, uh, very alarming. So meet uh, PyTorch TorchServe. It's the default deployment and the go-to when you finish developing a model in PyTorch and you want to deploy it and uh, in, give it to users. Uh, of course, you have many other inference servers, but this is the recommended way to deploy Torch uh, models. And it's an official uh, Linux uh, Foundation uh, uh, product uh, these days. Uh, it is used by almost anyone in the industry that wants to support it uh, because it's the default uh, inference server of uh, PyTorch including MLflow, Kubeflow, uh, even AWS and, and Google, they all uh, use it as a uh, paid product and uh, managed service. Now, we have four CVEs that when chained together, they allow us to uh, run arbitrary code, completely arbitrary code uh, that is attack and controlled. And using this arbitrary code execution primitive, we managed to steal models, model theft. We proved that model theft is actually uh, a real issue, and it's no longer a hypothetical threat. It's a real thing that can happen, and I just want you to understand the scope of model theft. When you steal a model and you work like one year or six months, or maybe less, but you spend a lot of time on iterating and building a good model, right? Then you deploy it, and the next day, someone just downloads it as if it was a file. That's broken by design. And moreover, it can poison the inference server and alter the predictions, alter the results that end users are receiving from the server, and because it, these are shadow vulnerabilities, it happens without you knowing. So just to understand the scope of the attack. And of course there's a demo, uh, we'll show it later, but uh, we have four vulnerabilities, we don't have much time, so I'm just going to dive into the more interesting ones, uh, the shadow vulnerabilities among them. And by saying shadow vulnerabilities, I'm saying that they could have been prevented. They're out there, but we could have prevented them, and um, it's mostly about usage and not reading the docs. And it can happen to every organization, even the large ones, including Meta, um, because errors do happen. So the first vulnerability is around the management API. We all have uh, servers that are dynamic, that can change, that can scale, uh, and so on. So the management API is supposed to be run, running only on localhost by default, at least according to the, to the documentation. Uh, but we'll see about that. 
And it allows us to manage the server, to uh, register a model, deregister a model, list the models that the server has at the moment, uh, define versions, and so on. But we'll see if it's uh, really running only on localhost or not. When I read the docs and when, when I actually read it, I want to uh, validate it and to, to see whether uh, it's actually true. Um, because many times we, we know that you can differ from the docs um, and the actual results might be different. So to validate it, I just went to uh, the config.properties file, um, which is, uh, um, as you can see, it binds to 0, 0, 0, 0, which results on all the network interfaces being exposed um, and the management API being exposed to anyone with network access, which is broken. And if this was not enough, the docs are very misleading already. If this was not enough, so uh, we had a hard-coded echo with loopback uh, address, which is kind of funny. Instead of string formatting like uh, any project does, uh, hard-coding the address of the server listening port and, uh, and host uh, is something that is uh, unexpected. And um, in reality, the, uh, the model, the, sorry, the inference server, instead of listening on localhost, it was available to anyone from outside the organization. And of course, nobody knew about it. So we have a management uh, API console that uh, we've seen thousands of instances that are exposed to the network, uh, to anyone who wants. And if I, as, as a user, wanted to predict an image and understand whether it's a cat or a dog, I could might as well just override the model, uh, steal it, and do anything I want, just um, because the, it's, it's kind of coupled. The same API is not running on localhost. It's, just accessible to anyone who could have predict an image, text, or uh, whatever it is. Now, back to the snake YAML use case. This function parses the YAML file, um, and as you can see, it uses the default constructor. All right, it uses new YAML and then YAML load. Uh, nothing interesting in particular. If you would have looked at it, you, you probably would have thought that it's okay, right, because it's the default behavior, and nothing uh, can, be, can go wrong. But this YAML, which represents a model deployment, is actually uh, running arbitrary code that is controlled by me, uh, an attacker. Uh, it, it will download the arbitrary jar file and execute it um, right away, without thinking twice, without validating. And of course, it depends on another bug, which I don't have time to talk about, which is an SSRF bug, uh, that allows us to um, download the jar file from any address, HTTP, HTTPS, uh, it does not matter. So to sum up this attack, so uh, a single HTTP post uh, can run arbitrary code on the server and take over the entire inference server uh, and do the following. So in the figure, you can see that the inference server is infected. TorchServe is running our malicious model. And then add users which communicate with the inference API use the new model instead of the regular one. Now, let's take it even further. So this is a demo of the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, uh, exploitation. So this model predicts whether it's a green light or a red light. It's a very simple dumb model that just uh, classifies whether it's uh, red or green. But uh, you can see that it classifies green as green and red as red. So using the exploit that we did, uh, the user has no idea that the uh, model changed behind the scenes. And now red light will result in green light. So just imagine um, the attacker, without any effort using a single HTTP request, could override the server and affect all of its end users. And I'm talking about big companies, right? So Gal, let me pass the mic back to you to uh, talk about the scope of the uh, impact and the result, the actual thing that. Thank you, Avi, for being so awesome. So. Shell Torch was all over in every media outlet, and I think this is where the world started to understood. First of all, that PyTorch is a very prominent target to attackers. Only a few months before, the Torchiton uh, uh, source code itself was infected, and there was around one million uh, downloads that were malicious. But this is the first example ever of an actual RCE, the one that you always uh, see when you're attacking web interfaces and web servers like this 10 out of 10 RC that actually eating one of the most famous AI um, frameworks in the world. And why is it so important? Because when we started discussing about uh, um, 
uh, the theoretical uh, aspect of it. And, and again, of course, we can hack to your infrastructure and use it with the high privileges to, to literally move in the organization and do it. But, but now we have something new. We are at the core of your AI infrastructure. And we can do stuff that you couldn't think about before, right? We could change the models and alter the results, as, as Avi mentioned, but we can see each and every data that flows through the model and communicates out, and, and like the, the, the risk or the potential damage, it's huge, right? And when we first introduced Shelter to the world, everyone was like, wow, super interesting, sounds cool, this is like th still a theory, right? Like attackers are still, like, you know, it's not a, it's AI, right? It's a buzzword. It's not actually happening. So, like, for us, it was very important to mention it is happening. This is where we actually took a step forward, and we found the first ever tech campaign targeting AI workloads. We're going to present it tomorrow. Avi is doing a lot of troubles. We're going to see it in the CNCF tomorrow after the keynote. We're going to uh, explain how Shadow Ray, uh, um, a very famous, uh, uh, um, AI framework, Ray, it's kind of like Kubernetes for AI, that also, again, we saw it into nothing, but again, a disputed vulnerability actually ended up in, in, in finding those uh, um, vulnerabilities. And when we actually looked inside, we saw there is a campaign that is actively going for more than a year. So just to, again, to sum it up, this is not a theory anymore. Attackers understood this is a gold mine. They want to get there. Everyone is interested about it, and this is why uh, uh, we decided to really focus on uh, these amazing uh, uh, frameworks. And um, one click here, yeah. um, just to, to like understand what we're uh, aiming on when we're protecting uh, uh, those type of attacks. For us, when we're talking about AI security, before we go into sixth grade and blocking prompts and like, uh, let's start from scratch, right? Your AI infrastructure is basically apps. This is the same type of apps that inherits the same type of problem for each and every uh, software that you already know and software problems. But the problem, the real problem is that those applications have a lot more power and a lot more responsibility. And today, uh, the White House and regulation around it, and everyone is talking about it, right? Because it's frightening and we're trusting it in everything we do in our life. And this is why we decided again to really focus on like securing your AI by starting first and foremost to secure your infrastructure, which means secure your apps. So first of all, like let's talk about the concept of shadow vulnerabilities. It's here like to stay. We have a lot of example of other uh, uh, shadow vulnerabilities that ended up uh, uh, causing devastating results. And this is why we think it should be a community effort. Those type of vulnerabilities has to be called out. In the end, maintainers, we do understand them and like, they're coming and doing amazing open sources, and like this is the way to do it. They're not security experts, they're not here to do it, but we have to trust these open sources. It's like everywhere we go, and this is why we think it should be a community effort. We're going to publish a huge list of all of the shadow vulnerabilities. We actually automated it uh, using our technology to find it in scale, but we urge everyone to add more and more examples. Again, just simply reading the docs, right? And. Um, just uh, uh, to emphasize, in order to actually catch attacks, you have to be in runtime to understand that the attack is occurring, right? And this is where uh, our approach uh, uh, and how we tackle stuff is very different, but it can actually help a lot. Only um, from our angle, what we do in Oligo is actually we're baselining how open source libraries should behave. What we're basically doing, we're monitoring the same pieces of code at enough environment for enough time to tell you not, how, not only how you use this piece of code, but how the rest of the world is busy using this piece of code. And then, only based on that manner, we can tell you when your open source starts to deviate from its normal behavior, we can actually detect, or detect it or even block it. And with that ability, we can actually, we don't care about no CVE or CWE, we care about that your snake YAML parser that should only parse files suddenly executes code, right? And this ability actually goes beyond what we know as the, the, the scope of application security. We actually, uh, uh, I know we look cool, but we're a bunch of nerds. We have like six different patents on the technology uh, that we invented that can actually help us to monitor any type of code. We don't need your code, we don't need your developers, and we don't need high privileges. Plug and play, we can show you for each and every app what is actually going on, which means also to do to the AI application that you just deploy 
even if you don't have the source code or you just deployed it or even bought it, like for us it's the same type of problem and what we actually do is by showing you what's risk are actually real and from there trying to actually add mitigations and detect attacks even without being aware to the actual associated CVE. So just gonna pause here because I need to breathe now and then, <laughs> but if you have any other questions, we would love to answer anything. Thank you very much. So my question is that uh, you know this onslaught of CVEs week by week. So whether the, uh, I mean the research about it, is it manual or somehow we can actually figure out what could go wrong? Because if it's manual, then it's kind of it's still not sustainable. Definitely, you're right. Actually, um, this uh, talk was also present, like a different talk about shadow vulnerabilities was presented at DEF CON last year, where we actually explained how we automated it. First of all, what we show here, it's only like the manual GraphQL searching on GitHub, but as I just mentioned, our technology can monitor any type of code. So basically, we went to Docker Hub and like we started monitoring projects and we wanted to see which project actually use snake YAML in an unsafe way, but as part of the logic. Not only at the beginning when it's like initiating something and configurating, and then it never uses it. So we actually automated it this own way, and with our technology, we find more and more vulnerabilities, including the Ray one that we're going to present tomorrow. So to your question, is it automated? Yes, does it have to be automated? Yes, there are too many vulnerabilities that are growing immensely, and like we cannot keep up if it's not an automated, scalable way. Hi, uh, you have mentioned uh, for these shadow vulnerabilities uh, some specifics being mentioned in the documentation but in a way that you have to really understand what's going on to make sure you're doing the right thing. Uh, there's something I've seen a lot of times, uh, I want your comment on this, it's the other way around, is uh, examples on the internet, maybe not from the official maintenance of some library or code that are wrong because they are misconfigured or there's just a proof of concept, they are too open in permissions, but people constantly copy and paste and implement yeah. them in production. Have, have you looked into, the, into this also? Is that your experience that this is also a problem? You want to answer? Yeah, so uh, we have been, and uh, actually we, um, we know what, as Gal said before, we know what is the normal behavior of the pattern and what it should do in real world scenarios. So, um, you should distinguish like unsafe usage and safe usage that is like partially unsafe or might lead to something unsafe. And we uh, go on and automate it with, with code QL and other tools, um, but um, it's not an easy, there is no easy solution. That's, that's why we think that it's a community effort and shadow vulnerabilities need to be called out. And if we have OSV or other vulnerability databases, um, we should have shadow vulnerabilities database um, that's open and examples of um, misconfigurations, silent misconfigurations that are uh, unsafe by default, uh, and so on. Um, LLMs might help here. I've seen some startups that try to incorporate the source code together with the documentation and trying to understand whether it's using it the right way or not. But um, personally, I, I, I think it's this, uh, this method is really hard to scale, and it's pretty expensive. And uh, it's not as efficient as having a runtime um, security product or something that um, sits in production or any given env environment and tell you where a new deviation occurs and over time. And you have a lot of factors that you can consider when looking on the deviation, like the uptime of the application, when it was changed the last time, um, did we see this behavior already, if, if we did, where, and, and so on. So it makes a lot of, uh, it makes it much more easy, easier for us um, to automate it using the behavioral pattern and not um, some CVE management solution that uh, names them, and, and that's it. Um, as we said, we want to protect ourselves against unknown unknowns, and this is the way we, we chose to solve it. Just to add on that, like, we do believe that security should be done in layers, right? So like, we do say, like, scan your code, do the stuff, like, you have to depose your stuff, but you keep on running on, like, trying to get to this theoretical zero, zero vulnerabilities, you can't. Like, 95% of what you're finding, it's not real theoretical, and that's why you have to have a different layer of real-time runtime that actually add mitigation, and it can help you to detect like the unfixable or the unknown, and with that create a much more 
holistic approach to tackle application vulnerabilities or tackle any risk in like, but what about supply chain risk, right? Uh, Exibeg though, stuff that are coming or like Palo Alto got hacked and then checkpoint have to equal, right? This is applications that are, you bought, you don't have the source code. But for us, it's just Java application that have a command injection and we can block it. Even if it doesn't have a CVE assigned or even if we are as a community are not aware to this risk and get a number associated with it. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> so yeah, snake, you have an example. I think it's bothering right as we speak to me because we are dealing with some fallouts. So, <laughs> so that was a good, good example. My question is that uh, some of these vulnerabilities which you find in CV, which is buried in layer, for example, there is this one byte buffer overflow somewhere. So what is the impact or what your tool does for closed systems where there is no one is running user brought code, user brought YAML file or something. So what is the outcome in that case? So each and every vulnerability, um, it's a theoretical risk. But for us, trying to understand, first of all, if this risk actually apply, what we do with our technology, we're gonna show you each and every piece of code, and we're gonna show you if it's running, and if it's running, which functions are running. So let's start by understanding, okay, you might have this theoretical vulnerability, but it's actually exploitable. In order for something to actually be exploitable, it has to be running and running the vulnerable function, and you need to reach with the vulnerable input to that function. No one checks that today. So just by showing you which libraries are actually running and function as parameters, we help you to just check the box, am I ex like actually vulnerable or not? Is this actually exploitable on my application? But then we don't stop there. Even if it's a one byte overflow or buffer overflow, he buffer overflow, or any type of CVE, for us, when it's starting to get exploited, it will create a deviation in the actual open source that is using it. Okay, so for example, I exploited this one byte overflow, but now as an attacker, I need to do something, right? I wanna write a sensitive file, I wanna uh, create a test scheduler that will run something in two months, I need to do something at the post exploitation technique. This is what we've been taught as the industry that today security tools are meant to detect, right? Someone is reading a sensitive file, someone is doing reverse shell, someone is already there, right, in order to do it. What we've done is the ability to actually profile and sandbox each and every open source library, only the act of exploitation will deviate from the normal behavior. We say, hey, one of your open sources now is actually actively being exploited. So just an analogy, we're not catching the attacker as they're trying to take everything and go out, we're catching the attacker as they actually try to open the door. Does that make sense? So we don't care about how the vulnerability started, what is the underlying vulnerability. We care how the vulnerability affects and change the way that this piece of code should behave in a legitimate behavior. Yes. Does that make sense? Answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>